see so many people here. And it's just really a pleasure to share her knowledge with, with, uh, with our community. She is someone whose entire life is her outcome. And um, even, even now, when we were installing the exhibition in container, Nadia decided that she wanted to present her two years in prison as a performance piece. And I think that's the way she looks at at art is that it's something that happens every day, no matter what material she's using. She's known as a punk musician, but in fact, she has always considered herself a conceptual artist and has been devoting her life to art since she left home at age 16 and went to Moscow from Siberia to study philosophy. She's a genius intellectually and a parent. <laughs> And um, I'm really honored to call you a friend and to have you in our world here right now. So thank you. And this um, slide presentation that you're seeing, we hope will give you an idea of the span of her work. And when I say that she uses every material available, um, it's true, you can see she's done NFTs. This is a print that she has made for this exhibition that in which she's drawn on her prison papers. And uh, you'll also see pieces of art that have been splattered with her blood. So uh, in this presentation, actually, you'll see things you may never have known she did, uh, like videos and um, a video piece that she did in Russia sort of exposing corruption in the political system there. So I really thank you, Mark, for being so open to bringing Nadia here and having a conversation with her. It's obvious already been a surprise, and I'm sure they'll be there. Uh, Nadia decided to play the organ about two seconds before she started. And Mark made it happen, so you guys, if you enjoyed your spontaneous concert. And with that, here we go. Well, I want to begin by thanking Tanya Turner Carroll and Michael Carroll uh, for bringing Nadia to Santa Fe, not just for the exhibition, but having her visit. Uh, this is really a wonderful opportunity. We're so happy to have you here, and thank you all. I got a preview of the exhibition last night. It's going to be amazing, so please do not miss it. Um, it is. I think it's something that uh, you'll all very much enjoy. It's very provocative, um, and I mean that in the best possible way. Uh, and um, yeah, it's just not to be missed. So um, thank you for being here. Thank you for coming here. It's a humble and honor to be here. Thank you for hosting at this beautiful museum. Um, I've visited this museum um, around five months ago and um, I came to New Mexico to visit to Chicago and we had one free day and um, I came here and got lost in this beautiful building with amazing artworks and well I, I couldn't expect that I'm going to be here on the stage so I'm really happy and humble. <laughs> Well, wonderful. Um, so let's start with the first question. Um, was that your first time playing organ? Yes. Uh, okay, so well, tell everybody the story you told me about learning to play piano. Well, yeah, I think from people in Russia, friends in Russia, at least friends of my generation, are so fairly conservative, so they want their kids especially for a girl to, you know, how to play on their piano or, mm, you know, the ballet. And so, <laughs> so I fell off and someone tried to make me paint and play it and it just didn't work. So she said that it doesn't matter what you do, you have to finish, um, you have to like, make this um, happen. Eight years of uh, classical music, painting, 
And I went through it, and I hated it because I had just a traditional music teacher. I, you probably saw the sixty-six stereotype, which is happens to be true. This mad wrestling teacher is the three of you for taking your own note. So the, I hated it, but then years after, obviously, it's just good enough. You know, you, you have to have a, an organ in front of you if you didn't play something. That's right. <laughs> Well, this is your baby piano lessons when they're taking it. Oh, yeah. I mean, when you have a kid, you want to do so many things and definitely not piano lessons. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, we're going to switch over from this PowerPoint to another PowerPoint. Uh, give me one second. Where 
and this war against this regime and um, our institutions that decided to be complacent and just uh, prefer not to talk anything about crimes of the regime because it was easier. And then we really made the transition to music and uh, we started to use music as a medium in India 2011. So by then, I've already been working with visual arts for, what is it, like five, six years. So then, uh, the reason we started to use music, uh, it, was, it was a joke. Um, so we were invited to make a lecture uh, at um, Silver Forum, and we promised to deliver a lecture about uh, pop feminism, and then we realized that there is no uh, there is no really punk feminism in Russia. So we were, um, we, we had created, and we created this right that night, and uh, the next day we presented a lecture like this one. And the next day, we were like, well, it's like, we don't know how to play music, like, we don't know how to play cars or drums or any of that, but we want to keep to spread alive, so we reached out to our community and we're like, hey, like, who knows how to play musical instruments? So um, we would just take tracks from, from other people and scrape stuff on top of it. Wonderful. Well, you can actually just kind of answered my second question, so maybe we'll skip past that one. Um, I didn't Over to your. <laughs> This is going to be easy. I did put a picture of your NFT uh, on the screen because um, uh, I, I wanted to ask you about the extent to which, even as an expatriate now, how Russia informs your practice. I feel like you just covered it, but if there's anything you want to add. So much to talk about Russia. Mm -hmm. Well, Russia is the epicenter of my practice and my soul. Um, I don't move geographically anonymous these days, which means that um, apart from the fact that I'm here today for this lecture and I'm here tomorrow for the opening, I cannot tell you where I'm based these days. So, um, Russia. Uh, I became a feminist in this state and um, because I didn't like the fact that we are saying world, um, you know, history is written by men, seemingly for men. And I didn't understand because uh, all the Indian teachers were women. And all of the best students were women as well, girls. Um, so there was a contradiction that led to me become a feminist. And then um, after that, I became an environmental artist. I was um, 15 because I'm from super good city. And I think there's some, I mean, it's pretty international, right? The climate crisis, the environmental problems, but we have our own specifics because Russia is so incredibly corrupted. Um, they just don't have to care at all about what they, what they do with nature. So through these two topics, feminism and environmentalism, I came to politics. Then I started to learn about queer and about queer theory. And um, at the time I already studied in Moscow State University and I wanted to write um, a coursework um, and I showed my diploma about queer identities and I just faced so much censorship and resistance from the um, Moscow State University, which is the biggest um, state university in our state, which supports homophobia. Uh, so I realized that every topic I want to tackle kind of goes, just disappears into the same piece of shit, which is Putin. And And um, as a teenage girl, I, I wasn't like super drawn to talking about politics from the very first place, and then I realized that all of this 
smaller, um, but the super important issues that I want to tackle, they all come down to the economic change the current political regime or make it reform at the time it still seems possible to reform it. Um, then it's on the people to um, step in further. So I believe I didn't choose Putin, it just happened. So like, everything I wanted to do was impossible to do without removing Putin first. And it's a big tragedy of my life and the lives of so many people whose trajectories close to mine is that it's 2023 and Putin is still in power. Let's shift gears a little bit. Um, I wonder if you talk about some of the artists that have influenced you and continue to influence your work. You can start with Judy Chicago if you like. We met with Judy the first time last year, and it was a huge honor. No one thought this was going to happen. Obviously, as um, any feminist artist um, was heavily influenced by what she was able to and is able to accomplish with her art practice. And what I specifically adore about Judy and Judy's practice today um, is that she keeps pushing the envelope um, in every possible way, including the um, tech part of the issue. So I guess the reason why she wanted to connect with me was because I was known as an artist who knows a lot about NFTs. So she told me um, that I want to be perceived as this age metric who, who just kind of done everything she needs to, to do and just stand still at this point. So she wants to um, continue to develop herself and she wants to be on the forefront of art evolution and maybe even art revolution. And this that's what we've been working with her. So we worked with her on the um, this particular project in the space in her piece, What Women Wrote the World. And I was the first one who um, recorded my question, uh, my answers to her questions. Um, but then we opened up for everyone. So anyone today can be part of what Judy Chicago is building with my little, a little help. And um, we're still, um, NFTs are still working on this. We're not rushing it because we're not in the uh, crypto market for, for the financial part of it. So we're kind of trusting the process. So at this point, we're just collecting the answers from people all around the world. And um, so if we're trying to be as diverse as possible, we um, did some recordings in um, Mexico, in Mexico City. Um, we did some, um, it's like a booth where people can step in and record their answers, which is all these questions. We did some in India, and at the moment, when we're both are very really good about those answers, um, the project will move forward. But um, it's been and an incredible learning curve, you know, Judy. So at Site you can see an amazing exhibit um, that shows another famous artist who is at 80 something, um, still pushes the envelope of technical production, right? Um, the way how Brisbane uses this um, amazing. Uh, how did he invent it? How did he... No, I mean, how do you... It's like he uses two iPhones. Two iPhone 6. And I was just like, I've never heard of it. I was just like, this is, this is something incredible because normally, like, uh, we're expected to just, uh, I guess, stop being as curious as we used to be when we uh, were getting older. 
And then, like, as far as the question is something, I was really constantly asking myself, like, how am I going to, like, what is my process of getting older going to look like? Looking at people like Gigi Chicago, I realized that um, there is no limits, really. You can keep reinventing yourself at any given age, and everything that was told when I was a little girl, um, um, that, you know, you're a maximalist right now, when you're 16, when you're going to be 30, you're going to change, you're going to be reactionary, whatever, you're going to stop asking questions, no, you don't have to. <laughs> Well, and Judy sent her apologies for not being here today, but she says she's still there. Uh, she's coming to the, um, to, to the gallery to see and to see stuff with me. Yeah. Yes. And um, Marina Obama has been very influential on you as well. Oh, I'm going to be talking about all of these metrics. That's <laughs> awesome. Yes, um, Marina Ramich, um, it's funny the other day I was there and just a random fellowship and I mean, I mean, a niece of Marina Ramich, who uh, did, did all this separated, this um, whatever, the panelists for the 20 part. Anyway, so she was like, oh yeah, I happen to be a niece of Marina Ramich. What? And she was like, I mean, the artist that should. Um, Marina Ravish, uh, I know her since 2014. She has been always, I mean, obviously, well, she's so well known in Russia. I, I, I think she's, she's a celebrity artist everywhere, but specifically in Russia. I don't know, we have like a sense of, a sense of, I hate to say, but almost like ownership over her. I don't know why, maybe because her name's not Slavic. I don't like this imperial thinking of Russian people, but I, this might help explain why Marina Abramovich is so jacked in Russia. So like even like the like the populist pop stars and you know the adherents of TikTok like super glam and have really nothing to do with contemporary art, they still quote Marina Abramovich as their biggest influence. Um, so I was honored to meet her in 2014. She came to um, she came to like, a gathering that we did in New York um, to meet all the people who supported the Red movement while we were in jail. And I have to say that was completely insane because it was Kim Gordon and Ernie Abramovich and some other heroes of mine. And then since then, we became friends. We really shared a lot of things. Like, for example, we never thought we were going to be fucking American people and enjoying it. So, <laughs> <laughs> so we, and, and, as people, because I was born in 1989, but you know, coming out of Soviet Union, yeah, I feel like I didn't live in Soviet Union, and still captured a lot of the mentality of Soviet Union, and my number of which also has it. So we just love to share this like old, racy, um, like really intimate jokes that um, Soviet Union is known for. And besides our personal relationship, obviously her past just is incredible because. I guess what the biggest thing that I learned from her is that if your idea is strong enough, you can do pretty much anything for it. And how fun art and your idea liberates you as a human being because I uh, think she talks about you know, the, the difference between her persona when she performs and her like actual self every day, Marina, and how she always becomes a, like, this this invisible goddess that's completely unstoppable if she believes in, in the idea of the performance. And she stands there until she she drops dead, and this is 
This is a lesson for all of us to learn. And this similar trajectory was what I experienced because I was growing up this is super shy child. And my mom was schooled in at school once just because um, she wanted to tell mom, at this moment she wanted to tell my mom that um, I'm not going to make it in life because I'm too shy. <laughs> and <laughs> It's hard to believe, but it's kind of sad. Yeah, I mean, like, the person on the fence. But seriously, um, I feel like art can serve. I mean, I'm a proponent of art being used by so many, so many more people than it's been used today, so that's why I feel like community, um, community building and community involves practices that um, I mean, uh, performed by museums and galleries are so important because if we all feel like our life is a work of art, we, we have this like, really healthy boundary um, between, uh, I, I know, we, we have this like, superhero power and we understand we can really build anything that we want to build from ourselves. And I spoke a lot about China by a music friend and And she said, at some point I was really shy, so almost like, then I just decided I'm not going to be shy anymore. And it's similar to me, and I feel like just so many people, like, for some reason, don't understand they build themselves and work hard. So, like, part of the reason why I decided to start um, working with performance art was because I wanted to work myself. So then I went to supermarkets and I started to shoplift and I worked six years of shoplifting because I wanted to challenge myself be like, can I actually build my own moral code? Because I really do believe that this fucking corporation is not going to lose anything if I steal a bag of rice from them. Right? So <laughs> In the like whatever normal um, ethical code, you're still committing crime. You're being a bad person. So I was trying to see if I can actually hold on to my own moral imperatives that I developed for myself. And I believe for six years, so much of working, I didn't lose money at all um, until I ended up in jail. Where I didn't lose money at all. Well, uh, since we're talking about the whole Russian artist, you expressed a lot of admiration for a lot of our artists in the early days of, of the 20th century uh, who challenged social norms and traditional notions of sex. Uh, and just before the talk, we were talking about uh, David Bolyuk. Did, did I just pronounce that David Bolyuk? Okay, sorry. Uh, who you could actually call a really sexual artist, and of course he's right there in the center. And uh, if you don't know really anything about him, he's a fascinating guy. He's of course painted his face, um, used to get into arguments with his audience, um, and famously called his manifesto uh, slap in the face of public taste. Um, so you, you talked about some of these early artists as being inspirations. Um, what kind of kinship do you feel with that history, either through your membership of Pussy Riot or your current career as an artist? I'll be putting my gold membership, so I won't take the house. That's cool. Um, well, I definitely uh, had a, a very first crush, and that was a Mayowski, and he's cute, right? <laughs> I was so jealous of where he didn't break a lot of his life. I was looking at her photos, and I was just like, well, I'm better, right? Well, this is like what's normal, and so then, just, I guess, 
I do a lot of Russian in Kowski. Um, but I really love um, utopian ideas of Russian avant garde, and I really vibe with their wish for art that is bigger than art. Um, I'm totally fine with other people doing art for the sake of art, but I would never do it by myself. And in that sense, I really feel connected to um, Russian avant garde. There's if you look at all the writings that Malevich and Gudinsky left after um, in Achim themselves, you'll see that they are, um, well, they're, they're the universe is much more than just that they are um, art practice. If you define art practice as drawing things or building things. So they really wanted to build a new world they did not succeed because Bolsheviks ended up being assholes. But I really love their intention. And this is something that I really wanted to do before. Uh, in the, um, in, when we started to practice art, uh, when I moved to Moscow in 77, uh, when I was looking for comrades to work together about this, like build, build this art community and make this art performances. And, and really involve the audience in what you're doing. Um, I wanted to restore this impulse of early Russian avant-garde because it felt like if you if you trace it, it was it was murdered either literally, like it happened with Vidensky who died um, being just from Maggi after another, or Minkowski who killed himself. They they were quite literally exterminated. And then throughout the Union, we couldn't really talk about anything like that because he would just be labeled as a degenerate artist and uh, people would be in the institution or sent to jail. So and then the next um, group of artists who approached it probably were Muslim passionists. And they explicitly connected themselves to the ideas of Russian avant garde. So there was this um, guy who was on like his gurus, Dorisnovsky. Uh, uh, he made an action in the 90s um, where he climbed uh, onto a giant um, monument of Mayakovsky in the middle of Moscow. And he sat on his shoulder exclusively telling that the, the radical artists of um, our days are like, standing on the, uh, on the shoulders of these giants who are this guy's. Yeah, that's wonderful. And, and I mean, not to put words in your mouth, but the, you know, your comment about developing your own sort of ethical and moral code, I mean, that's what they were after as well. You know, they wanted a different society, one that diverged from the corruption of Tsarist Russia. Um, and they had this sort of great optimism in the Soviet Union, and it basically evaporated. And, and you're right, a lot of them were either killed or silenced. Um, Baruch um, left, went to Japan, and ultimately came to the US uh, and settled in Brooklyn. Um, and it just seems fascinating that there were parallels with your experience. Pretty much now you can also see this Navalny's jail, some, some of my friends are dead, and uh, some of us are just scattered around the world, and it's really sad to see how history is just repeating itself. Uh, that's it's not the case. What do we do with the gender history? <laughs> but it happens when you don't learn your history. It's no wonder it's happening because we never um, had a chance to reflect on our history. Because really, we have to say this one decade to talk and think relatively freely in the 90s. Before and after, we always existed under a censorship, so we couldn't really think. Um, so we could, I mean, we could say, but we could not express it. Uh, and so our humanitarian science was just destroyed because people didn't know like what, 
what kind of, what are we allowed to say there? Because it's just so confusing. In the Soviet Union, it was one thing, then Nancy's brought another narrative, and then with the early Buddhist regime in the 2000s, you know, new rules came. So when I was studying philosophy, it was a, just a crazy salad of ideas and theaters and self censorship. So I don't know what it's going to be as work, but um, you know, all of these terrible things like marches in support of Stalin and Putin uh, and his um, and his jails, uh, his his uh, people who surround him openly praising Stalin for being an effective manager. I think all of it, all of this blindness of our history brought us to the point where we are now. So I think it's important to learn what happened on the years ago, right? Yeah, I agree. And I think I, one of the things I really like about your comment is that you know, you know that their utopian ideas fail, but that doesn't mean that the idea itself is failed. Um, that there's a lot there to do. Um, well, that actually prompts me to move to the next question. Um, you said activists and art always go hand in hand. Would you like to talk about that a little bit more? For me personally, yes. Uh, but I don't like to be prescriptive, or I just don't like to preach. Uh, it was added like a funny experience that I, I wrote my book written right. I feel like it was just like this. I guess it was this school of thought in um, American culture that really likes to be preachy and descriptive. So there was just like, can we tell us how to make our religion as well? It, it's not as easy. So this book was just, it was a result of me going back and forth with um, my editor and our opponents. But they also love to sell books, right? So they didn't want this to make a scandal. Oh my god, if not, when you go read this 10 rules of how we made a revolution, is, oh, things are much more difficult in real life. Um, um, so, yeah, I want to be prescriptive, but for me, I always like saw from my personal experience, and in my personal experience, they always came together, um, art and activism. For the, for the reason, uh, I don't know what started first. It's like cheap and negative. I don't know what, what, what is cheap and what is an act. And, uh, I'm addicted to both. But I, I do think that art is a really great tool um, if you want to change people's minds. Uh, because, and as long as art can be more, it can be stronger than tax symbols because it's both the amount of energy for the body. And, um, art can change your mind, and it's stronger, and art has longer term consequences than tanks and bullets. It's not always true, so again, it just works in my experience. I think art is really stressful when you want to amplify your voice. Um, in our position, sorry, we had to work. It was me, my cat, my friend, and another friend, so just like three of us, and this cat who's constantly pissing in our all of this. We didn't have a big movement or like, you know, money, but like, we didn't have anything fancy. So we had to work with just what we had, and it wasn't a lot. So I think in this conditions, art really can help you amplify your message and create this ripple effect that will be seen by people and you know the, the fact that we are sitting here right now inside of it and, and, and talking about um about depression, about activism, about the threat, um really shows that it, it might be true. So um when it comes to activism, I believe that you don't necessarily have to use art or have to use art, but you have to realize that you can use any strength of, strength of yours that is available to you. Well, sounds very good, but let me give you an example. So some people look at um, AOC 
and being just like, oh, she's like so open book, and she's uh, she's a Christian cultural leader. And by the way, I met her at Union um, Square when she was working at the bar, just friendly. <laughs> Seriously, not um, And then, and then you know they look at this wonderful, loveless book of leaders, and it's just like, well, I, I, I can not do anything because I don't like that I'm an introvert. But you can do so much uh, other things, like maybe you can help homeless person in your area, maybe you can use some other um, you know, strengths that you can use unique, uniquely yours, and it doesn't have to be hard. So, you often identify as a conceptual artist, but you really do have an affinity for materials. Uh, there's a great materiality to what you do. Um, you know, the faux fur, the um, sort of outmoded hardware, I and mean, all of that has, I think, a really sort of spectacular aesthetic. Um, would you talk more about the importance of materials in your practice? Mm. So when we talk about conceptual art, I guess it's important to talk about this school that's called Moscow Conceptual Art. Um, there's this amazing guy, um, Bill Grice. He teaches at um, anyway, you have to live. So he's um, he's a researcher, he's an um, art um, writer, art critic, um, and philosopher. So he came up with this concept of Moscow, uh, Moscow romantic conceptual art. And why it's romantic? Because it has, it's much more physical and emotional than in the other tradition of conceptual art. So when all of these artists, mostly based in Moscow, um, just start to get their, their first info from different channels, it's really difficult to say opinion. So in the 70s, they start to get information about artists like just conscious and they reinterpreted it in, in a way that is much more personal and romantic. That's why he called it romantic, so I think because it gives much more uh, space for expressing feelings. And I guess because I was involved uh, mostly by Moscow Moscow conceptuals, much more than American conceptuals. I think they're Awesome, love that. But I was growing up with this this guy's um, from my country, so I think that's where all of this sensuality comes from. And uh, have an explanation for fabric um, and the explanation for using textile and fabric in my work is um, that because we're so interested in this. Um, Probably for thousands of years, it was labeled as low art for crafts or mostly females um, kingdom. And obviously, as you know, women were never praised for their art for whatever reason, even though we were doing art in fact. But we were never called geniuses or high artists. So uh, I'm just working here in the tradition of this amazing. Or a famous artist called Use Textile and Reclaim It. Um, and I'm the reason why I used Textile because I was working with it and I was in jail and I was forced to sell painting farms, uh, both and poultry farms. I never saw before, and it just took me in front of a sewing machine and told me that I have to figure it out in the next three days, otherwise, I'm going to let down everyone else. And it's it's a chain uh, production, so they give they, they, uh, 200 pieces of military uniform and have to fulfill sort of an operation on it, so I have to do it as, as quickly as possible. So while doing all of these pieces, I was using this techniques that is it to, when you give me something physical. <laughs> I, I, I do things really quickly with my fingers. I think partly because I play the piano. Uh, second, because I like to hand jobs. Third, uh, because um, 
um, because <laughs> but I just had to move away from worms really quickly when um, I was showing those human worms. So I didn't know that it's music like, here. It might be the podcast's designer I've seen. It's because it is a bit easy to do things really quickly. Um, everyone else worked 16 hours a day. It was really a slave labor situation. Uh, I was working almost eight hours because I had lawyers and it didn't want to let me work more. Actually, it was right. I was asking to work more because I had the same quota as everyone else. So I had to, in eight hours, I had to do it all day right, in 16. So I had to work plus and plus as everyone else. So, yeah, female work plus you know, prison work. And I guess what I was trying to do here is to um, work through this trauma that I had with this physical labor that I had to go through. Because it's a lot of physical labor, but like, when you're forced to do it, it's like anything but like you. So I was just trying to reach my psyche and be sickle so it can be up. Like something positive. It can be something that you actually enjoy. It can be something that destroys this machine rather than sports can. Alright, so last question. And I had promised Nadia that I wasn't going to talk about music too much, but I do have one music question, but I try to perform. So, do you see a connection between punk or post punk? By which I mean Devo or Susu or the Talking Heads. So do you perceive a connection between post punk, between punk and post punk, and conceptual war? Mm, I really love pure punk. So post punk, I guess, whatever they, they seem to, I mean, I don't know. I love all of them because it's just so pure, it's pure gesture. To me, it sounds like they're, they're really close to conceptual art. And as we discussed yesterday, it also came around the same time. Um, I love um, what Sex Pistols did with the ship. I mean, like, they both move and they perform in front of the, I think it was walking, looking at the pilots. Um, we actually made an homage to them and did one of our actions on the, um, on the boat as well, in front of the Kremlin. Um, and so I love this, that impulse. And I think Bonk is very conceptual in a way that it, it's simple and it can be you know, a really deconstructed to what, five basic elements. And I'm not going to name all of them, but it's just like, you know, Love music, the mobility of behavior, love costumes. Um, yeah, so I, I do think that there is a connection. And when we started with Scrat, I was really adamant about the fact that we have to play punk music. And all my friends uh, were actual musicians, corporate actual musicians. Um, they told me, well, it's not, let's say that they're out of fashion, and so they probably should do something more uh, like hot punk or like whatever the fashion will be fun, and then they don't have to do this great, raw, uh, raw power of um, punk. And we did. Um, Well, there, there, there are multiple, um, multiple stories, I'm not going to get into them, the, the connection of the early punk with the um, socialist movement and the workers' movement and punk bands formed from the you know, religious workers who decided to express their social consciousness through punk, so it was really influenced by boy punk. And one of our um, first um, tracks we did um, by sampling an early, um, early open book by Angelic Custards. Uh, and Angelic Custards, I believe they were, uh, they played um, a song in jail. Uh, they played a concert in jail once. 
and they are both as a uh, Christian collective. <laughs> they were angelic. So they were, <laughs> they were letting me deal, and then they had this nice to song called The Separation that they were playing there. Then I just love this. And I guess like, what, what was close to conceptual art is just like, the sense of freedom. Is that you can take the medium and do what you want with it. And there is no actual rules. So the only one who is very rule. Well said. That is my final question for you. Is there anything else you'd like to say in conclusion? Come back tomorrow at 5 p.m. So um, going to be interesting. We built a total installation. And I guess it's important to mention Yakov of uh, who recently passed away. Um, he uh, he's a Russian conceptual artist, part of this Moscow romantic conceptualism. He um, he's known as one of the inventors of this idea of a total installation. Um, and total installation um, means that the artist doesn't need, um, it, it, it's not satisfied with just hanging things on the wall. It's a part of that school thought that says that the um, gap between the um, artworks tells you more sometimes than the artwork itself. So, um, it's a part of, uh, it's part of, I guess, the movement that says that the artist has to be um, its own creator, their own creator, or just working with the creators, and building the whole experience of the space. So that's what we did in the last three, four days, and um, we basically turned a um, container into this experience. Um, not to be, not to be uh, messed and not to be mixed with those, those type of commercial experiences that are more commercial. I guess this is like it's something that is called still installation, so it still exists on the territory of art. But it's a point of fantasy to mind. If some of these saw the pictures or oh, weren't there, the artist basically built his own world and populated it and created um, his own rules. Thank you so much, everyone.